Good Friday service from wherever you are watching us from, uh, for the congregation that is here. I would like us to pray uh, even before we begin the service uh, of today. And uh, after the prayers, uh, we are going to welcome the worship team uh, to lead us from there. So let us all pray. Our Father and our God, we thank you, we bless you for giving us, O oh God, a day like today, O oh Father, to be in your presence, O oh God. We thank you, Jesus, because you came into this world. You died for our sins, O oh Lord Jesus, that we may receive eternal life, O oh God. So we thank you, Lord, that for those who have received you, O oh Lord, you've given them the opportunity, the power to become the children of God, born not of the natural birth, O oh God, but born by the Spirit, O oh God. So we thank you, Father, this day, O oh God, that even as we remember the death of Jesus Christ on the cross, O oh Lord, we declare, O oh Father, that you did a mighty work on the cross of Calvary, and you have saved us, O oh God, and you are saving many more. So, Lord, we are in your presence this morning, O oh Father, praying that this day, O oh Lord, you will come through in your mighty anointing, O oh Father, revealing yourself into us in a mighty way, O oh God. Glory and honor be unto your Father, majesty and adoration. Thank you, Father, for giving us another opportunity. For in Jesus' name we pray and believe. Amen. So welcome, worship team, and uh, lead us on from there. Hallelujah. Jesus, Nashela Calvary. Kaliba Kaladi Betarona. Yo, yo, Calvary, yo, Calvary, Jesu na shwela, Jesu na shwela, Calvary, Kaliba kala di mikaruna, yo, yo, Calvary, yo, Calvary, Jesu na shwela, Jesu na shwela, Calvary. Kaliba kala di besarona, iyo iyo kalvari, iyo kalvari, Jesu na shwela, Jesu na shwela
you, O oh God. We thank you because you defeated hell. You defeated the grave, O oh God. And this time you've given us victory. You've given us victory, O oh God. And we praise and exalt your holy name because you reign forever. We ask you to reign, O oh God. We ask you to reign in our lives. We ask you to reign in our, our nation. We ask you to reign in our churches, O oh God. Come and reign, King of Kings. Come and reign this morning. We thank you, worship you.
you are holy you are holy you are holy thank you father for your anointing that is flowing in this place your anointing oh god that is reaching to every end of the world oh god because you are a holy god oh father thank you father god lord almighty that oh lord even as your word comes unto us we declare oh god that the word of god will sanctify us oh god will come, O oh God, with anointing, with power, with clarity, O oh God. We thank you, Father, and for your servant who is going to minister to us, O oh God, this day. We declare, O oh God, you are in this place and you are working across the whole globe. So be thou glorified and be thou exalted. We love you, we worship you, and we adore you in Jesus' name. Amen. So thank you very much, choir. The Lord bless you. And it is a good time to hear from the Lord as we welcome the servant of God, our pastor and our mom, Pastor Grace Wajambo. Welcome, mom, and the Lord bless you as you minister to us. Amen. We are grateful to the Lord for this day that he has given us that we may gather to worship him and to give thanks to him for what he has done for us. We commemorate what we call the Good Friday today. We commemorate the day that the Lord Jesus Christ was crucified on the cross for our sins. And I want to welcome you yet again to this service uh, from wherever you're watching us. <clears throat> I'd like us to take the text from Matthew chapter 27. I'd like us to take the text from the book of Matthew, uh, Matthew chapter 27, the account of the crucifixion and the death of Jesus. Matthew chapter 27, I start reading from verse 32. It's a long passage, but I think it, it is good for us to read the word of God. Some of us don't take time to read, so let us read the word. Matthew chapter 27 from verse 32 to 44, we are talking about the cross of Christ and his crucifixion. The cross of Christ and his crucifixion. So Matthew 27, 32, now as they came out, they found a man of Siren, Simon by name. Him they compelled to bear his cross. And when they had come to a place called Golgotha, that is to say, place of a skull, they gave him sour wine mingled with gall to drink. But when he had tasted it, he would not drink. Then they crucified him and divided his garments, casting lots that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophet. They divided my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. Sitting down, they kept watch over him there, and they put up over his head the accusation written against him. This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Then two robbers were crucified with him, one on the right and another on the left. And those who passed by blasphemed him, wagging their heads and saying, you who destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself. If you're the son of God, come down from the cross. Likewise, the chief priests also mocking with the scribes and elders said, he saved others, himself he cannot save. If he is the king of Israel, let him now come down from the cross and we believe him. He trusted in God, let him deliver him now if he will have him. For he said, I am the son of God. Even the robbers who were crucified with him reviled him with the same thing. Verse 45, now from the sixth hour until the ninth hour, there was darkness over all the land. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. That is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Some of those who stood there, when they heard, when they heard that, said, this man is calling for Elijah. Immediately one of them ran and took a sponge, filled it with sour wine, and put it on a reed, and offered it to him to drink. 
The rest said, let him alone. Let us see if Elijah will come to save him. And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. Then behold, the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And the earth quaked and the rocks were split and the graves were opened. And many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. And coming out of the graves after his resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. So when the centurion, who and those with him, who were guarding Jesus, saw the earthquake and the things that had happened, they feared greatly, saying, Truly, this was the Son of God. And many women who followed Jesus from Galilee, ministering to him, were there looking on from afar, among whom were Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Joseph, and the mother of Zebedee's sons. Hallelujah. Praise God. That is the reading of the word of God. Giving us the account of what happened on that Friday. And uh, like I said, I just want us to share about the cross of Christ and his crucifixion. There is so much that we can gather from the passage that we have read. But I just want to share a few things. Um, uh, about the cross, about the crucifixion, you know, the crucifixion of Jesus, and what all this means to you and to me. Is it just a historical event? Is it just something that happened? Or is there something that uh, we can learn even from this? One of the things that we want to find out or to realize is that crucifixion was both painful and shameful. Crucifixion was both painful and shameful. But when we come to uh, try to understand the sufferings of Christ today in our generation, it's sometimes made difficult for us to understand, for us to capture, you know, the seriousness of the sufferings of Christ. Because some of the things that uh, have uh, have happened even in the Christian fraternity. The, the, uh, the traditions, the Christian traditions, and uh, what I would call religiosity, it has made it difficult for many of us to understand and to get the grips of what the sufferings of Christ really were. You know, when the, when the, the Christian tradition causes the cross to appear like a gisty thing, like an ornament, an ornament I can wear on my, on my neck, an ornament on my ears, you know, something beautiful. When we look at what uh, the cross is made to look like, then we are not able to get the, the, the gist of the cross, of the sufferings of the Lord Jesus Christ. So both the painful and the shameful aspects of crucifixion have become blood. They are not clear. That aspect of the pain and shame, it is not clear. To the extent that what we think we know about this manner of execution it's not the same as it was to the Christians of the first century. What they knew and what they grasp about the sufferings of Christ and about the, the crucifixion. For us today, it seems to be difficult to, uh, for us to, to understand. And even when we read the New Testament, we find it does not provide much information concerning the details of crucifixion. Even when we read from the scriptures, and when we check all the four gospels, the authors were very brief, like what we have just read in the book of Matthew, chapter 27. It just, we, just say, we just read, they crucified him, period. And they are, they are so brief in what, in even uh, uh, giving us an, an account of what that crucifixion really was. And so we find there's a few reasons. There are two reasons that we can gather from this. Is that the people in the first century were all too painfully familiar with crucifixion. It was common knowledge to them. 
It was something not necessary to, to, to explain because they knew it. It was common knowledge to, uh, to them. And so even the, uh, the gospel authors, when they are giving us the account, they decide not to write all the things that happened on that day. Another th and, and one of the things I was even thinking, if somebody today here in our nation of Kenya ministers and gives an example of kutoa uh, kitu kidogo, you know, giving something small, for us in our generation, we understand. We understand what that is. We understand the grievousness of the sin of corruption, you know, and we may not even explain much, but we just stay. When you just say in that, those Swahili words, toa kitu kidogo, people will understand. But maybe another generation or people from another nation may not grasp. So I think that is how these authors were seeing it, it is very common, so they didn't give the details. Another um, reason, more importantly, is that the crucifixion was so utterly repugnant, so indescribably shameful, yeah, that they deemed it improper to go beyond the barest minimum in describing our Lord's experience of it. It was an awful, awful experience that they, they, they decided we don't want to put that on paper, you know. Well, uh, the writer of, I think it's Paul, uh, uh, writing to the Philippians in chapter 2 and verse 8, he's talking about Jesus and he said that he humbled himself, partly, I'm quoting it partly, to the point of death and then he adds, even death on the cross. That is very loaded. Even death on the cross. The pe people of that age would understand what death on the cross really meant. And that is what they were portraying even when they were writing for us to read today. And then from the history of crucifixion, we find that the cause of death on the cross resulted from a combination of many things, which included the scourging, the way he was beaten many stripes and his skin was torn, the loss of blood. There was so much blood that was shed from the body of Christ. Of Christ. The shock from the pain. There was so much shock from the pain, shock from the, even the loss of blood, all which produced agony that could go on for days, ending at last by suffocation. Suffocation is not being able to breathe. Cardiac arrest, or even we can call it uh, heart, heart failure or something, and loss of blood. There was so much that our Savior Jesus went through for you and for me. The crucifixion, such pain, such shame. And worse than the physical pain of the cross was the shame of the cross. Such shame. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18 to 25, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18 to 25, we find that the message of salvation through faith in a crucified Savior was deemed foolishness and a stumbling block because the cross was a symbol of reproach, a symbol of degradation, a symbol of humiliation and disgust. That is what the cross signified. And that is what God, uh, caused Jesus to go there on the cross because our sins were the same. Our sins are so uh, degrading, humiliating, they are a disgust to God. And that's why Jesus went to that cross. He took that disgust of our sinfulness on his body at the cross. When he was crucified to that cross, he was taking all that disgust on himself for our sake. Crucifixion was designed to not only kill a man, but humiliate him as well. 
For example, crucifixion was always public, usually at a crossroads or elsewhere on high ground. The reason was to intensify the sense of social and personal humiliation. And that is why we have read in Matthew 27, from verse 39 to 40, that, and those who passed by blasphemed him. There were passers by because it was either at a crossroad or near a road. Those who passed by blasphemed him, wagging their heads and saying, in part, if you are the son of God, come down from the cross. That is the humiliation that Jesus went through. Not because he sinned, not because he was a robber or a murderer, but because he was carrying your sins on his body. That is not even enough. Victims of crucifixion were usually crucified naked. John Calvin wrote in part that the Son of God is portrayed as stripped of his clothes. And we have just read uh, in verse 35 that they divided his garments. They stripped him and divided his garments, casting lots. And so he was stripped of his clothes that we may know the wealth gained for us by this nakedness, for it shall dress us in God's sight. When we, we, uh, he became naked, so that he may clothe us today, praise Jesus, that we may not be naked before him or before people. Our Savior Jesus Christ, suffering the shame of nakedness by his obedience to the Father, he clothes us today in the righteousness of our God. Hallelujah. Isaiah 61 verse 10 says in part, Isaiah 61 verse 10 says in part, For he has clothed me with a robe of salvation. He has wrapped me with a robe of righteousness. That is what our Savior did. He took our nakedness, so to speak, and covered us with his righteousness. Amen. Glory to God. And then the concept of him as Messiah evokes images of power, splendor, and triumph. And that is what he is. A God of splendor, triumphant God, God of power. We glorify him. And that's why even uh, uh, when they were singing, when he was going into Jerusalem, Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. They were celebrating the Messiah. And only to crucify him a few days later. So the concept of him as the Messiah evokes the images of power, of splendor, and triumph. But he put on weakness. He put on degradation. He put on seemingly defeat. But by being crucified on the cross for our sins. So he put on that weakness that we may get strength. He put on degradation and that defeat by going to the cross for our sins. Hallelujah. He became a curse for us by the crucifixion. And so he redeemed us from the curse of the law. Galatians chapter 3 and verse 13. Brethren, Jesus went through so much. I may not... Uh, exp uh, um, explain more. I may not narrate more of what uh, he went through even on that day. Even as they nailed him to the cross. The issue of the, uh, the crown of thorns on his head and all the things that they did on him, spearing his, his side. Jesus went through all this for you and for me. Amen. And we may ask ourselves, so what, what is it that he accomplished? Why is it that he went through all that? The scriptures that we read tell us that he went on the cross suffering the eternal penalty that we deserved. 
The reasons being one is that God is holy. The holiness of God caused Jesus to go on the cross to suffer shame, to suffer humiliation because God is so holy and yet he desired to relate with us human beings. But because he's so holy, he had to punish sin. The eternal penalty for our sins that we deserved went on Jesus. That is why he suffered such shame and humiliation at the cross. Because God is a holy God. And Isaiah had a glimpse of the holiness of God. In Isaiah chapter 6, verse 1 to 3. Isaiah had a glimpse of the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lifted up. The seraphim, who are angelic creatures, they cried to one another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. Isaiah saw a bit of the holiness of God. He is so holy. He is so highly exalted. And because of that holiness, that's why Jesus had to go to the cross and take your sins and my sins. And that gives the second reason for Jesus going to the cross. The depths of our depravity. Jesus went to the cross one because of God's holiness, and two, because of the depths of our depravity. Isaiah, when he saw the holiness of God, he was able to see he, the depravity of his sins. He said, woe unto me, for I'm a, a, a man done. I'm a man of unclean lips. I live among a people of unclean lips. And Isaiah saw the depravity of his sinfulness. He saw the gravity of how evil sin is before God. When you see the holiness of God, there is no way you will not be able to see the depravity of your own sin. That's why in Isaiah 64 verse 6, he writes and says, Isaiah 64 verse 6, he says, For all of us have become like one who is unclean. And not just unclean of a little uncleanness, filthy. And all our righteous deeds are like a filthy garment. Our righteous deeds, even when we have tried our best and we think that we are doing the best, even then, those deeds are like a filthy garment before God because he is a holy, holy, holy God. And that's why the seraphims were emphasizing three times the holiness of God. And uh, Isaiah continues in verse 6 of, of chapter 64. And all of us wither like a leaf and our iniquities like the wind take us away. Brethren, today, and all my listeners, I desire that today you may be able to appreciate the sufferings of Jesus. You may be able to appreciate the crucifixion, the purpose of that crucifixion. There are some people who ape it. They, uh, they make, uh, they make a, um, a spectacle of the same. That means they have not really grasped what Jesus went through for our sake. If we are not able to answer why Jesus went, it means we have a diminishing sense of God's holiness. And I pray today that if you have a diminishing sense of the holiness of God, but that God today will convict you that we may be able in your spirit to grasp his holiness. Another reason that we may not be able to grasp is a diminishing sense of mankind's sinfulness or your own sinfulness. You are, you are having a diminishing sense of your own sinfulness. If you do so, then you will not even be able to appreciate 
what Jesus did at the cross for you and for me. And there's a third one, an inordinately increasing sense of self-worth. Today we have people who, who think they are not that bad. Did really Jesus have to die? Huh? Was it necessary for Jesus to die? They, they, they can't help to wonder why Jesus had to die for them at all. And this is pride. This is pride. When you think of yourself more highly than you ought, you think that you, you are good enough that Jesus doesn't really have to die for you. So even if you hear that Jesus died, that all the things that he went through, the suffering, the shame, the humiliation, it doesn't bother you. It's because you're thinking of yourself more highly than you ought. It is very, very, very bad for you and for me to think that way. And so I desire, like Isaiah did, that each one of us may be able to say that God is holy and woe unto me for I'm, an, I'm a man of unclean lips, that we may be able to accept Jesus and ask him by, that, by the blood that he shed at Calvary, that he may wash our sinfulness away, that does disgust of sin, that he may wash it away from our heart and remove it from us and clothe us with his righteousness that we may be acceptable before God, that we may have fellowship with God, that we may have communion with the Lord our God, that today we will celebrate and we will say, thank you, Jesus, for dying for us. We will celebrate and say, he went to the cross for me. He went to the cross for me. And I pray that today that we will have um, conviction of sin. That we will not trivialize sin anymore. That we will know every sin is disgusting before God. That we will quickly repent of every sin. We will quickly turn to the Lord Jesus Christ that he may cleanse us. And that we will have uh, even our relationship with one another rectified before God. So I want us to pray together. And I want to pray for those of you who do not know the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. You pray and it's, uh, 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 like this and say, Lord Jesus, I, re I realize how much pain and suffering you went through for my sake. And I, know I realize also my sinfulness. I pray that you may wash me and cleanse me by your precious blood and you will be born again today and for all of us I pray that Jesus may convict you we may have the conviction of the Holy Spirit and we may be transformed that from today we will live holy lives uh, appreciating what Jesus did for us at the cross may the Lord bless you may he keep you may he protect you from sin and shame and humiliation and may he clothe you with his righteousness in Jesus' name, amen. And if you have prayed that prayer, I want to assure you that the Lord Jesus has heard you and now you're born again. And I want to encourage you to send us a text on this number, which is our prayer line, 0747-704-861. I repeat, 0747 704-861. Write us a text and let us know that I have become born again. And we are going to reach out to you so that we will be able to pray with you and follow you up and encourage you and find out maybe where you live, whether you live near where we are or elsewhere. We can even help you to find somewhere that you can go and fellowship. So may the Lord bless you and keep you, may he keep, uh, cause his face to shine upon you. Thank you very much, uh, Pastor. Uh, we thank God even for the ministry of the word. And uh, we would also like to share with you our number so that we can give together to the good God who has saved us 
and also to the almighty God, Jesus Christ, who gave his life for us. So we are going to share with you our pay bill number, and our pay bill number is 797748. Our pay bill number is 797748, and you can write there uh, if it is giving or welfare, you know, even at a time like now, when uh, we are not meeting physically, we still need to support even those who are not uh, able amongst us or even within our surrounding. So please uh, send whatever the Lord has blessed you with and also in your offering to this very number and the Lord God Almighty will bless you. Amen. Now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us now and forevermore. Amen. God bless you. Amen.